Dr. Moni Deepa Becerra is a professor at California State University, San Bernardino. She has a master's of public health and health policy, a doctorate of public health and health education, and a certificate in health geoinformatics from Loma Linda University School of Public Health. She is also a certified health education specialist. Her primary research emphasis is on epidemiology and the interplay between social structures and individual level variations that impact health disparities among vulnerable populations. Due to her research background, Dr. Becerra has also been invited by local institutions of higher education to present on health disparities. I would like to welcome today, Dr. Becerra. Thank you very much. I'm really glad to be here. What are health disparities and why do they matter, especially now that we are facing a pandemic? Um, thank you for the question. So health disparities are preventable health burdens and related outcomes such as exposure to violence, behaviors, um, access to health care and such. And health disparities are driven by inequity, which is very distinct from inequality. And sometimes we combine the two as if they are one and the same. However, inequality is an imbalance. Inequity, however, is injustice. And it's that injustice that drives health disparities. And often when we think about health disparities, we think racial, ethnic only, but we also have to recall that other minority populations and their intersectionality of that, that impacts all types of minority groups, such as low income populations, immigrants, um, sexual and gender minorities. And when you combine them with being also a racial ethnic minority, those populations suffer a higher rate of health disparities. Especially now with COVID-19 um, pandemic that is going on, we are seeing that more and more that racial ethnic minority groups and other vulnerable populations are suffering a higher rate of just not getting the infection, but also mortality associated with it, being able to pay for the treatment should they end up getting COVID-19. And it's really, really bringing to light the inequity we have in our society right now. So what is the current status of health disparities in Riverside and San Bernardino counties? So both San Bernardino and Riverside counties are what is considered MUAs or medically underserved areas. And undoubtedly that has led to a lot of the health disparities that we see. For example, county health rankings is a really good source of looking at where we stand compared to the rest of California, the United States. And we can see that out of 58 counties in California, San Bernardino County ranks at 53 and Riverside at 40 when it comes to quality of life. So compared to the state of California, we're fairly at the bottom, but even within the Inland Empire, we see that there's disparities between San Bernardino and Riverside. When it comes to clinical care that takes into account the patient to physician ratio, San Bernardino County is at 55 out of 58. So we're definitely suffering when it comes to access to health care. Um, but both counties also have exceptionally high rates of HIV, specifically some geographic regions within the counties. We also see high rates of cardiovascular diseases and the intermediate risk factors, such as type 2 diabetes, hypertension, high cholesterol. But that doesn't mean all is negative. Over the last several years, especially after the Affordable Care Act, the health insurance rate has gone up in the Inland Empire. We're seeing a reduction in the CBD. We're seeing a reduction in childhood obesity rates. So the, it is going towards a positive side where we're seeing lower amounts of health disparities. And comparably, eventually, we will get to the levels that we hope to by healthy people. Would you agree that COVID-19 has highlighted pre-existing health disparities in different ethnic groups? Absolutely. I think one of the earliest discussions that we've heard out of COVID-19 is that racial ethnic minorities, especially Black African Americans and Hispanic Latinos, are the ones that are sharing a high rate of the infection when it comes to as well as the mortality. And that really does raise the question why. The infection itself doesn't impact racial ethnic minority groups differently than others. So why is it that they're really being impacted in a negative way? 
a lot of researchers nowadays are looking into um, questions such as, is there a high density of minority population living in my medically underserved area? Is there historical reason where there's distrust towards the healthcare system? Is there fear towards the healthcare system? Is that what's preventing people from following up and going through screenings or compliance? Or is there an inequity in distribution of resources? We see that you know, our area is in a medically underserved area. Is that why people cannot get the screening as frequently as some other geographic areas? So as much as we would want the pandemic to end and any health disparity end, we really have to look into that if you want wellness and health for all, we really have to address health disparities for racial ethnic minorities. And I think COVID-19 is something that's brought this up again, even though we've seen it with cardiovascular disease, um, diabetes in general, HIV, we're just seeing it again, just in a different scenario. Okay, who would you say COVID-19 is affecting the most? Is there an ethnic group that is more at risk? Thank you for that question. So um, we're seeing this data change on a regular basis because this is a brand new strain. We don't know how exactly it's impacting our population, especially the long term. Initially, a lot of the data showed it's those who have a chronic illness or those whose immune systems are suppressed are more likely at risk. But we're now noticing even young, healthy young adults are getting it. And there's been a talk in the literature, especially related to tobacco use and vape, vaping. So young adults who otherwise look healthy and are healthy, uh, maybe they're tobacco users or maybe they are vaping and that's probably what is putting them at risk. So we're constantly seeing the risk factors change and getting updated. Um, the virus itself, as with most diseases, does not impact a particular racial ethnic group more. But as we talked earlier, it does show like particular racial ethnic groups more are suffering. And that really has to do with allocation of resources. Are we providing the care in an equitable manner? Are the physicians available in areas that have a high racial ethnic minorities? So even if the disease itself doesn't actually target groups, it's how we've set up our social determinants that's impacting certain groups more than others. Now we're seeing in New York, children are seeing the long-term effects of COVID-19. So the population at risk is constantly changing at this moment. What are some of the current challenges to addressing disparities and making sure everyone affected by the virus gets appropriate care? Thank you for that question. I've been very fortunate to have really good colleagues who are in the front line right now working with COVID-19 in both the counties. A lot of them are actually our alumni from our programs. And what I'm hearing um, from our discussions on a regular basis is a the biggest issue that they're facing is misinformation. It's um, a lot of information about COVID-19 is going up that even the terminology is not being used appropriately, um, what it is. There's questions about would antibacterial soap kill a virus? And you know, there's a lot of misinformation and that's a challenge that seems to be very consistent. Um, my colleagues who work in the field actually are saying that is probably the biggest challenge that they're facing is that when treatment are being given or recommendations are being given to screening, the background misinformation is there and that's not helping with the treatment or the screening recommendations that's being given to them. So a lot of the work has been focused on trying to remove the misinformation and provide culturally appropriate, linguistically appropriate um, content that anybody of different language barriers can understand and comprehend and then follow through. Really, this is targeting health literacy again, which in the United States is a major, major social determinant. Absolutely. Thank you so much for mentioning um, about health literacy, because you're absolutely right. That is one of the um, main factors that creates disparities. That's right, man. Absolutely. What is being done for ethnic groups that face significant disparities in access to and utilization of care during this pandemic? 
That's actually, again, I'm going to have to give credit to the people doing the work actually in the field. So a lot of them, again, are people I've gotten a chance to know because either they are my colleagues, alumni of our programs, or even part-time faculty in our program who are working in the field. Um, for example, the one of the coordinators for anti-bioterrorism is one of our adjuncts who also works in emergency preparedness. Um, Amarwa Ahmed, who's one of our alumni, she works in San Bernardino County WIC program. And that is the one that's working heavily with actually giving resources and information to racial ethnic minority groups. One of the issues that they're facing is that a lot of people who may have barriers to language are not quite understanding the information that's been given to them. And so making it culturally appropriate, making it linguistically appropriate, teaching people how do you sanitize correctly? Where is it that you go get food since they work in WIC a lot of the people who are under WIC are not being able to find the food they need. So giving resources on this is where you go to find appropriate food that you know is under WIC as well. Um, Cindy Mahoney, another, I will give credit to all these people because they're the ones doing the actual work. Is she works in a youth development as a youth development specialist in a local nonprofit. And one of the biggest thing they're doing is using social media to reach out to young adults because young adults are a huge information source for their family who may be racial ethnic minorities as well as may, English may not be their first language. So having targeting the youth is a great resource and that's something they're working on. Another colleague of mine, as well as alumni of our program, Robert Avina, works at a nonprofit in Riverside County that targets HIV population. And one thing they're finding there is obviously HIV positive patients are more at risk of any other health disparities. So how do they really deal with that? How do they provide the existing services, but also account for making sure the resources are going to the minority populations? So they're obviously changing things to telemedicine. A big one they're working on is teledentistry, that people do not end up not having the treatments they need, the care they need because of COVID-19, simply updating it and constantly reaching out, creating tutorials that are culturally and linguistically appropriate ways to reach out to our minority populations. And that's been just some of the examples I'm hearing from the field that people are actually doing. What are public health officials doing to ensure that COVID-19 prevention measures are reaching disadvantaged populations? Thank you. So I think this goes well in hand in hand with the people I mentioned earlier. Um, they're all public health officials working as the directors or program managers or community managers. Um, I'll give you an example. One of the things that we often see when it comes to vulnerable or disadvantaged populations is intersectionality of belonging to multiple minority groups. I'm very fortunate to work with a group of people who target um, our sexual and gender minorities who are also racial ethnic minority and culturally or in family, they may not be accepted or stigmatized. So for a lot of the such populations, the only source has been their peers or social support group. So what do you do when COVID-19 happens and isolation is placed in protocol? You can no longer go to these social support groups. You can no longer go to your peers. You're now at home in a family where your culture is now stigmatizing your sexual orientation or your gender identity. So this is where public health officials come in. And now a lot of our colleagues that I see what they're doing is holding virtual social support hour, or often some of them call it virtual happy hour, but it's really about being able to see each other, talk to each other virtually, and keeping our vulnerable populations in a positive mindset, because mental health is a huge part of fighting any sort of health outcomes. That's definitely one of them. Um, the other one, as I mentioned earlier, um, a lot of HIV positive patients need beyond HIV treatment. They need dental care, they need appropriate mental health care, and you can't necessarily go to any clinic to provide that. 
So organizations that are one-stop shop for everything are creating ways to reach out to such populations through use of social media, through use of just virtual means, or even including community members. That's been a large way of including community leaders that are trusted to incorporate them into reaching out to such populations. Because when you see somebody from your community, you're likely to trust the information that's coming from them. And those are just some of the examples from the field. Thank you for the question. Can this pandemic create an opportunity to discover new solutions that can reduce health disparities? Absolutely. I think one of the things that COVID-19 has done is really test us to see, are we prepared for the next pandemic? Are we prepared for the next emergency? At this moment, we're dealing with the pandemic, but we live in California. We could potentially have an earthquake, the large one, and are we prepared to deal with it? And we can see in some sectors, we've had resources, but we just simply hadn't used it to its full capacity. And in some other areas, we're noticing maybe we are not well prepared. And I know one of the biggest things that's being discussed is policy. Ultimately, if you want to address health disparities, simply changing individual mindset or behaviors is not going to change it. We need structural social changes, and that often comes from policies. And one of the policies that uh, some of my colleagues and I that we've been noticing in the literature being discussed is sick leave. So we have sick leave in the United States, but not to the same level uh, globally in some other industrialized nations. So for many people, especially low income individual vulnerable populations who work at jobs where they do not have sick leave or they're not able to take it, they continue to go to work when they're ill. Well, if COVID-19 is saying you need to stay home and there's isolation, self-isolation is required, how do people who don't have sick leave or cannot use it manage that? That's really raising questions on how we handle our work health policies, our occupational health policies. And that will likely change how we look at COVID-19 or future pandemics or emergencies and how we approach work environments. And also make sure it's financially stable. Not everyone can take sick leaves all the time and not have financial stability. I think this also brings to something that public health has been talking about for a while, is having cross collaboration across disciplines. You cannot sit in the health field and talk about economics and financial stability if you don't reach out across the border and talk to somebody who's an expert in economics. So we're going to see more and more new policies that are being developed that's cross-disciplinary, really thinking outside the box to see what can we do structurally so that people can be more compliant without negatively impact impacting their lifestyle and especially financial abilities. So we definitely can see that coming. Thank you, Dr. Becerra. It has been such a pleasure speaking with you we really appreciate you sharing your knowledge and wisdom um, with us on health disparities in Riverside and San Bernardino County. Thank you, I appreciate you inviting me for this.